The passage on which the teaching is based this morning is printed in your bulletin. It's uh, 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 2. This summer we've been looking at these two letters by Paul to a young church, a church filled with young Christians, a new church that he had planted and, uh, in Thessalonica, and these are his, uh, his letters, and we've been moving through them, and now we get to the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Let me read it to you. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And, when, and then the lawless one will be revealed. And the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. This is God's word. Well, I've never preached a sermon on the Antichrist, I don't think, before. Uh, I was checking, you know, I've been around for a few years, and I was checking all my files, and there wasn't much to look at. My own files, my own talks, and so on. Uh, there are two passages in the Bible that are so clearly about this particular figure. Let me read to you the other one. It's in, uh, and you'll see the, the parallels. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, we read this. Dear children, says John, these are the last days, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Indeed, therefore many Antichrists have come, this is how we know it is the last days. Now, that's pretty interesting. If you see in both these passages, here's what we do have. We have a statement that says that there's a force or a spirit at work in the world between the first and the second comings of Christ, which is what the Bible refers to as the last days. From the first appearing of Christ on earth to the second appearing, there's a period and there's a spirit that John talks about. He calls it the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, Paul calls it the secret power of lawlessness. This is going to have multiple manifestations. See, Paul says it's already at work. Uh, John says there's numerous manifestations, numerous embodiment of it, but near the end, before Christ comes back, there's going to be a kind of final one. There's going to be a, a great one. And that's what we're told now. My goal today is to ask, what does this passage not telling us it's almost as important for Christians when you look at a passage like this to really be clear what it's not telling us. And by the way, it's not telling us an awful lot, uh, an awful lot. And then what it is, because what it is telling us is incredibly helpful, tremendously important for understanding what it means to face life in this world. But we can get just as tripped up if we miss what isn't said as what is. Now, the best way to put this would be to look at this under three headings. What does this text tell us about the man of lawlessness, the power of lawlessness, and the healing of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness. The, what does it tell us about the power, which is the real point? And what does it tell us about the healing and how the healing of lawlessness goes? Let's look at it. First of all, who is the man of lawlessness and what do we learn about him? And, and I would say at this point, we don't know much at all. Let's look and see what we, we don't know about the man and then what we do. Most of, first of all, the most important thing, the most obvious thing is we have no way of identifying this figure. We have no way of identifying who or even what he is. You see, when you take a look at it, it says the man of lawlessness, he's called the man of lawlessness, he's called the one doomed to destruction. The, uh, the important thing is to read this along with 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, I am not going to talk to you about times and dates. 
about when Christ comes back. He will come as a thief in the night. What's that mean? He says, I refuse to let you get obsessed with trying to identify the nearness or the farness of Jesus' return. I'm not going to, I don't want you to do that. He will come as a thief in the night. Night is a way for Paul to say, it's completely impossible to predict. You can't possibly know. It would be terrible to speculate. It would be dangerous and stupid to sit around and try to say, this has to happen and hasn't happened yet. This will happen. This has happened, therefore it's near. He says, it's a thief in the night. Thieves in the night do not come on schedule. You can't know when thieves in the night, you're not gonna, you can't know when, whether they're going to come tonight or not. You don't know when they're going to come. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, no times, no dates. Now, if you think he's flip-flopping here in 2 Thessalonians, where he seems to give a sign, you have to put it in this context. In 1 Thessalonians, this young church had been kind of knocked around by a teaching that said it was, it was, that was obsessed with trying to understand exactly when Jesus would come back. But in 2 Thessalonians, look at, at the passage that we have printed. There's a different kind of teaching, the exact opposite. Paul says a lot of you are getting all riled up by people who are teaching that the, that the second coming of Christ is already over, that the day of the Lord is already past, that it's already been realized. Now, if you think that's very odd, I want you to know that uh, that is one of the dominant teachings in the Protestant church today. Paul is upset with it. He's against it. It's, the, it's almost the opposite of the, uh, of the false teaching in a way he was dealing with before. Uh, he, was, he was at first dealing with an, with an over-obsession with the second coming of Christ, and now in this letter he has to deal with an under, in a sense, interest in the second coming of Christ. You see, the teaching that the day of the Lord is already passed is really quite typical today. This is a way, and there's various forms of it, but it comes like this. This is a way of saying, hey, the second coming of Christ is a symbol. The second coming of Christ is not a historical event. It's a symbol. It symbolizes the fact that Christ lives on through his teaching and that when you embrace that teaching, he, in a sense, becomes a living reality in your life and he comes to you. So, in a sense, there is no historical event in the future. It's, it's already past. It's already over. It's already been realized. Paul and I think this is what, where he threads the needle. Unless you read 1 Thessalonians with 2 Thessalonians, you'll really, I think, get tripped up. He gives us a sign. He says that there is something happening in the world and it's going to come to a head right before Christ comes back. And that's his way of saying this is a historical event. Jesus' second coming has not been realized. It is in the future. But his description is so generic that there's really no way really, even though people have been trying for 2,000 years, there's almost no way possible for anyone to identify this. Who is the man of lawlessness? Well, a lot of people say a political leader. doesn't say that. Maybe it's some quiet little philosopher, some tenured professor somewhere, writing his little tomes, you know, off in the... In, you don't know, and not only that. I think one of the greatest exercises possible is to go into the Gospels and read every Old Testament prophecy cited by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Paul. Go into the New Testament and find every Old Testament prophecy of the first coming of Christ. Go see every one of those prophecies and ask yourself, if I was reading that before Jesus had come, would I have known how he was going to come, what form he was going to come in, and so on? Some of the Old Testament prophecies came true very literally. Others did not come true very literally at all. In fact, some prophecies you say, I would never, ever, ever have understood that as, as, as working itself out like that. And therefore, all prophecies about the second coming of Christ must be received with tremendous humility. In fact, if we're really going to look at the prophecies of the second the way the, the, of the first, then we're going to have to realize that we don't know whether this is even an individual or whether it's a body or a group or a movement of some sort. No, 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 we can't. We can't know that. It's really impossible. But here's what we can know. When Paul says, this will be a man of lawlessness, and the power of lawlessness is already at work, he says something extremely interesting. The word lawlessness, the Greek word that Paul uses, is a word that literally means without law or anti-law. In fact, some people, uh, John Stott, who has written a good 
commentary on 2 Thessalonians says, you should be translating this word, the antinomian, which is literally what it says. The one without law, the one against law. And this is very important to understand. Paul is not talking about disobedience. Lawlessness is not disobedience. You see, lawlessness is not saying, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Lawlessness is, say, is saying, who's to say what right and wrong is? I recently have been reading sermons and letters by Martin Luther King, and there's an extremely interesting place where Martin Luther King was in jail, and he, in 1963 he wrote the letter, his, his letter from Birmingham jail. And this is what he says. He says, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law the law of God. Now listen to this next sentence. An unjust law, to put it in terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, is a human law not rooted in eternal and natural law. Now here's what Martin Luther King is saying, and it's amazing. Martin Luther King led people into civil disobedience. He intentionally led people to go, he led his people to go places and sit places and be places that it was illegal for them to be. Was that lawlessness? Not a bit. He didn't respect certain laws. It's not that he didn't respect law. In fact, he, respect, he did not respect certain laws because he respected law. He said, there are unjust laws, and how do I know that? He says, because there's an eternal law. There is, a, there is an eternal absolute law that not only do I have to believe, but I can call anyone on the face of the earth to believe it as well and obey it. Now, here's the difference. Lawlessness is saying, my feelings are more real than any law outside of me. But Martin Luther King says, the law outside of me is more real than any of my feelings. Those are two completely different worldviews. One has tremendous respect for law. The other one is, is without law, disdains the concept of law, disdains the idea of law. The first worldview may obey or disobey law, but it's the second worldview. It's lawlessness that says, who's to say who right, what right and wrong is? Only I can say what's right or wrong for me. Recently, I had a chance to read, uh, or I started to read a biography of C.S. Lewis. Somebody says, wow, what a surprise. You would read a biography. Too. But what's interesting is I'm reading a biography. Uh, it's a very well-written biography, but it's by a biographer who's very hostile to Christianity. One of the things that amazed me was at one point in the biography, he gets to C.S. Lewis's little book, very influential book called The Abolition of Man. And in the book, Lewis says that for the first time in the history of the world, the Western intellectuals are saying that moral judgments, every moral judgment is rooted not in eternal law, but in my feelings. In that book, he says that up until the, up until the 1940s, 1930s, every society and every culture everywhere in the world always said that moral judgments, to be true, must be rooted in eternal law. And Lewis points out that today what is happening is the intelligentsia of the West say that moral judgments are always subjective, that when you say, I think sex outside of marriage is wrong, what you mean is I feel it's wrong, and therefore it's wrong for me. And when I say, I think racist laws are wrong, what you really mean is I feel they're wrong, and therefore they're wrong for me. And the biographer, who's not a Christian, says an amazing thing. He says, Lewis's contention, which cannot be historically denied was that there had been an absolute system of values which abhorred murder, lying, theft, unkindness, disrespect for the old, selfishness, and greed. It was seen by all moral and religious centers in all cultures in all centuries, and this had been true from the very beginning of all literature until the mid-20th century. Now, I, this is, and this is exactly what Paul said. When Paul was writing, lawlessness was unbelievably rare. Here's a biographer who says Lewis is right. There has never been a, sense, a, a culture, there has never been a, a century, there has never been a religion, there has never been any society until around the 1940s in which there were any, was any kind of consensus that said there was disagreement over what the law was, but there was never disagreement about whether there was anything right or wrong more important than my feelings. 
He says, but when we get up to the 1940s, for the first time in history, there's a consensus growing that says, who's to say what the law is? Now, it's pretty interesting. We live in a world <laughs> in which a lot of people say we can't build that dam because that's the last place where the snail darter lives. And if we would get rid of the snail darter, how that might screw up our entire nat the natural systems of our ecology out there in that part of Tennessee and so on. And by the way, I'm very, very, I'm pretty sympathetic to that kind of talk. And yet, people today, now Lewis was right in the 1940s when only the, intel only the intelligentsia said this, but now it's the 1990s in which it's just out on talk shows and everywhere. And Lewis says, people have discarded something in the last 50 years that from the beginning of time, every century, every culture, every society, every religion has always believed, and that is that your feelings don't matter. What's right or wrong is out there. That there is an eternal law in which moral judgments are based, that you do not decide what is right or wrong for yourself. No one ever, except a little interesting person over here, a little sort of strange philosopher, nobody ever said that in any kind of major way. Paul says lawlessness, and this is amazing because lawlessness virtually didn't exist when Paul says, was writing, but Paul says there has been a force released into the world and it's going to grow and it's going to get bigger and bigger and it's going to take on more and more powerful and visible and solid manifestations until the end. And it's, this is exactly what's happened. There is no denying it. The thing that Paul said was going to happen has been happening. Now you see, by the way, why? Now, here, well, listen. Uh, one of the things that's pretty interesting about this is in the, 19th, in the 20th century, there have been totalitarian regimes of the right and the left. You have fascism and you have communism. And you know, do you know fascism and communism are utterly opposed politically? Do you know they have utterly opposed views of economics, utterly opposed views of race, utterly opposed views of government and, and, the, and, and the nature of government. And yet, on both sides, in the 20th century, through these, plates, through these kinds of states, we have seen genocide like we've never seen before. Why? Because they rejected what Martin Luther King said and what all cultures and all societies have always said. We might disagree on whether there is a law, but no one ever had the audacity to say out loud there isn't any, that I have to decide what's right or wrong for me. That spirit, Paul said, is at work in the world now. And back then, people would have said, You're ridic that's ridiculous. Only idiots would say something like that. No one would say something like that. And now everyone is saying something like that. Oh, it's in the world. And if you think we haven't had some men of lawlessness in the 20th century, oh my, we have. But here's what's frightening. Paul says, it's not done. As soon as you think, if you think I'm saying it's, there's a political leader coming, oh, no, no. Sure, it's easy to look at Hitler as a man of lawlessness, but you see, the secret power is a philosophy. It's a belief. It's something that plenty of people in this room have. And Paul says, in its great manifestations, it's utterly destructive, but it starts as a little seed. Now, do you see what we, what we do see and what we don't see? We don't know much about the form or the manifestations. It doesn't matter in a sense. Paul and John both say the important thing is to realize it's going to manifest itself, so you have to understand it in its seed form. And that brings us to the second point then. What does this passage tell us about the nature of this secret power that's at work in the world, that's growing, that years ago people would have said, no, no, no way could it take form, no way could it take shape, but it has. If you take a look at the man of lawlessness, as Paul depicts him, you will learn something about this secret power. See, in verse 7, this is where I get the title of the sermon from, it says the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the Greek word that Paul uses that is translated as secret power, and secret power is a good translation, and it's fine, but the actual Greek word is the word mysterion. And literally what Paul says is the mystery of iniquity. I want to tell you about the mystery of iniquity. And when you see how he depicts the man of sin, people over the history have missed the tremendous insight I think you see in verse 4 when it describes the man of sin. Because the man of sin is supposed to be a picture of the mystery of sin. 
The reason we need to understand the mystery of sin is we need to know how it works in our lives and how it works on our relationships and how it's, how it's destroying the world. In verse 4, we learn about the nature of this mystery. In verse 4, it says, the man of sin will set himself up in God's temple. He will set himself up in God's temple. Now, over the years, people have been very interested, and I don't want to make you laugh. I mean, I don't want to laugh. I don't, let's not laugh at, at the very sincere Christian teachers over the years who have tried to figure out what that teaches. They, you know, some people have said, oh, all right, I'll tell you a couple, and they're not funny. I mean, in the early church, a lot of Gentile Christians that started to let anti-Semitism grow in their own hearts, they said, well, what that's talking about is some Jew in Jerusalem is going to take over and persecute the Christians. And, of course, around the time of the Protestant Reformation, we know that most of the Reformers said that, that the Antichrist is the Pope, you see. And, of course, a number of Catholics had other views. I mean, we've all had our views. What this, and today, there's many people that say that the temple has to be rebuilt in Jerusalem and some political leader will come and sit in that temple and exercise power. And if you, all I can say is please go back to the prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ and I'll put some humility into you. But anyway, here's what it really tells you. Is the nature of the secret power is it can't stand what's at the heart of the temple. And it puts itself in place of what's at the heart of the temple. What's, what's in the heart of the temple? In every temple in the world at that time, and even today, in the center of the temple is something that shows you what is at the center of reality. And in every other temple in the world, there's an image. A picture, a depiction of some kind of the deity. Usually a beautiful picture or maybe a terrible picture. Something to inspire awe or adoration or, or loyalty in the worshiper. But in the temple of God, in the tabernacle and temple of God, no image, but not nothing. What was there? What was there? What was at the center of the temple, which was God's way of trying to show us what is at the center of reality? It wasn't nothing, but it wasn't an image. It was an object of furniture. But the more, most important thing is that object of furniture showed us an event. It wasn't an image, it was an event. You know what that was? There was a wooden box in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle and temple, and inside the wooden box was the law. The Ten Commandments, the two tablets that, that Moses brought down from the mount. And over the box, though, was a golden slab. And the job of the priest, so that the demands of the law could be met, by the person who was coming in to speak to God was the priest would have to come in and bring blood and sprinkle the blood on that gold slab which was called the mercy seat. And God said, if you put the sacrifice of someone else's life over the mercy seat, then I will be able to meet with you. And God put that in the heart of his temple. What was that? It wasn't an image. Tom Howard, a Catholic writer, puts it in a way that just, you know, gives me goosebumps, and I'll try my best to give you goosebumps as well. He says, the mystery of God, the, he says, the mystery that God gave the Israelites in their temple is the same one he gives us. It has not changed. The mystery which was supposed to be at work in Israel, as opposed to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Egyptians, which made God present to them in the rite, R-I-T-E, of the tabernacle, was the mystery upon which all life proceeds and which will never be outgrown since it's there at the root of all things. It's the mystery of, and he puts this in caps, it's the mystery of my life for yours. At the heart of the tabernacle, at the heart of the temple, was the, the event of a sacrifice of someone laying down life that others might live. At the heart of the tabernacle, the heart of the temple, the place where God was going to say, I want to show you my essence and the root of things, the, the nature of reality, the ultimate, the mystery of life, the mystery of grace, the mystery of who I am, my life for yours. Now, what Tom Howard says is very interesting. He says the central mystery of the world is there in the center of the tabernacle, my life for yours. He says it is the central reality of both creation and redemption. Listen for a second. Come with me. 
There's not a child in the world that's alive except by my life for yours. Some poor woman, the child's mother, had to lay down her life for months in order to bear him or her and had to literally lay down in pain in order to actually give birth. And no child in the world has any physical life except some people who are able to make money took that money, which instead of spending it on themselves, they laid it down. They gave it up. They spent it on the child. No child has any emotional health except somebody was continually, some adult or adults were continually saying, my life for yours. I want to go do something else, but for 10 minutes instead I sit down and play with a child. My life for yours. Dying little deaths. My 10 minutes? No, yours. My money? No, yours. My comfort? No, yours. My life for yours. You realize that a foretaste of heaven is to come into any relationship or any community in which everybody is saying, my money for you, my energy for you, my time for you, and the other person's doing the same back. That's a foretaste of heaven. Physical life proceeds on the basis of that, and only on that, laying down. Biological life, social life, civilization. But, and here's the mystery of iniquity. If that's a foretaste of heaven, what's a foretaste of hell? The foretaste of hell is the opposite. The spirit of Antichrist is the opposite. And here's the spirit of the Antichrist. This is what sin is made of. This is the mystery of iniquity. It's the very opposite. The man of, of lawlessness hates what's in the temple and replaces it with himself. In other words, the mystery of sin is your life for me. That is sin. For a moment, let's not look at the laws. Let's look at the law. Let's not look at disobedience. Let's look at lawlessness. The law is lay down your life for others. The law is don't look to your own needs, look to others. And sin is your life for mine. Listen, in this world, in almost every society, cannibalism is eschewed. What is cannibalism? What do you think cannibalism is? It's hell. It's literally your life for mine. And, of course, we don't like genocide either. That's where one ethnic group actually comes in literally and takes power and, and, and wealth and so on by replacing, saying, your life for mine. We kick you out. We wipe you out and we take what was yours. We take your land. We take your influence. We take these things. Cannibalism. And you say, how awful. But when you're at work and somebody does something and you don't pay them for it or you don't, you're not grateful, do you realize... Paul says in Romans 1 that the very essence of sin is ingratitude. You know what ingratitude is? You've given me something and I, my life, no, no, your life for mine. I take you, I use you, your life for mine. It is not only that in the center of the, of the temple, my life for yours is the secret of creation. It's also the secret power of redemption. Because we know that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice. When he came to earth, he was always talking about the law. Remember when John the Baptist says, why do you need to be baptized? He says, and what does Jesus say? To fulfill all righteousness. Jesus Christ was thinking about the law. Jesus Christ knew that the law, the eternal law, had demands. But does Jesus Christ come and say, guess what? The law is not important. Just be sincere. Oh, no. Galatians chapter 4, Paul says, God sent his son when the time had fully come, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that they might receive full privileges as children of God. God made him sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Exchange my life for you. That's what Jesus did. You know what? If God had created an image, tried to create an image in the temple, what would it have been like? Would, it, would he have had a loving, joyful look on his face? But that wouldn't have told us about his holiness and his justice. Would he have had a holy, just look on his face? But that wouldn't have shown his love. Would he have had this wise, profound look on his face? Only my life for yours shows us the incredible holiness, the tremendous love, and the unbelievable and profound 
unfathomable wisdom of God at once. Sin, the secret power of lawlessness, utterly hates that. And therefore you see, if your life is ruled by your life for mine, hell begins now, and you will hate the law. But if you look at what Jesus has done for you, my life for yours, you will see that he satisfied the law, that you're forgiven, and you will come to love the law. Now, this passage tells us, therefore, the mystery of iniquity, and it tells you, therefore, how it can be healed in your life. Now, here's how it can be healed. It says the man of lawlessness is destroyed by the splendor of his coming. See that at the very end? The splendor of his coming. And I'm telling you that you need to be healed and I need to be healed of the secret power of lawlessness which is already at work. I've just given you a picture of it. Instead of sitting around trying to figure out who this guy is, we're supposed to look and see what is the principle, the power that he simply will embody at the end and we have to say, is it in us? The answer is yes. All destructiveness in your life comes from it. And therefore, we need to ask ourselves, how can we be healed by it? Well, like this. Number one, first of all, admit it's there. Do you admit it's there? It is so subtle. Listen, some of you, you know what? The secret power of lawlessness, your life for mine, using people, the secret power of lawlessness doesn't just get more so as the world gets older. I have noticed that it gets more so if I get older. When I first come to New York, I've seen this in a lot of you, you first come to New York, you're very eager to meet with people and lay down your life for people and open up, and as time goes on, you start to get tired. And you start to say, you know, you know, people in New York, they leave anyway. And I have to start to make new friends. And making new friends means laying down your life, opening up your heart. Oh my gosh, that's just too much work. Now somebody's going to say, oh, but you know what? I have a different problem. My problem is I tend to burn out. I tend to give myself too much to people. But even there, that is really secret lawlessness. If you give yourself to people and you can never say no, and you're always burning out and you can never put down boundaries, you know why you're doing it then? You're doing it because you need to know people need you. You're doing it because you need to be saving people all the time. And you know what that is? That is using them. That is their life for yours. That is. Don't you see how the power of lawlessness is so hidden? It's so secret. Do you see it? Do you not see that destruction in your life comes from it? Let me get all the way down as much practical as I possibly can be. If you are really demolished today, it's because like the man of lawlessness, all of us put ourselves in the place of sacrifice. That's what the guy does. He puts himself in the temple. He throws away the ark. He throws away the mercy seat. He throws away all these things, and he puts himself there. Now, that's what I do. Let me be real honest about this. My reputation, what if somebody criticizes me? I should be hurt when somebody does that, but if I am destroyed, it's because what I have done is I've put myself in the place of sacrifice and my reputation has become my salvation. You see, if you are just demolished because you have or are about to lose money, you have or you're about to lose romance, you have or you're about to lose uh, reputation, if it's just destroying you, if it's just demolishing you, it's because of the secret power of lawlessness. It's because you, like all, Take the temple of God and you put yourself in the center and you become the Savior and you become your own salvation and all the problems in our lives come from that. You're never going to overcome the secret power of lawlessness until you admit it's there, until you see it's there. Do you see it? But then secondly, how do you deal with it? Not by trying harder. This is actually almost a repeat of last week. It says in verse 8, it's the splendor of Jesus that destroys the secret power of lawlessness. The splendor. You don't just say, well, I shouldn't be so worried. Instead, you say, look at what he's done for me. Look at the temple. Look at the mystery of life. That's one that destroys the mystery of sin. Look at the mystery of grace. That's the thing that destroys the mystery of sin. Look and say, why am I trying to be my own savior? 
Look what he's done for me. Why am I so worried he's going to let go of me? Look what he's done for me. You, you marvel at Jesus until the anxiety recedes. You look at his splendor until the mystery of sin, which has got you by the throat, begins to recede. Do you see that? And most of all, Christians, the reason that the man of lawlessness is lawless is because he replaces God in the temple. If you see that you have been accepted, if you see Jesus laying down his life for you, you can look at the law and not be upset with it. I was reading about a woman, a, a, an English teacher at a college, who asked her college students, a secular school, not a Christian school, to read the Sermon on the Mount, and they hated it. And they said, the Sermon on the Mount makes me feel like I should be perfect, and nobody's perfect, and I hate feeling guilty. That's a great way to know whether or not the splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ is operating in your life. Do you know that he laid down his life for you? Do you know that he had the big exchange? That he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him? If you know that, then you can look at the law of God and not be intimidated or hate it. You can say, look at the beauty. I'm accepted. I'm received. I don't have to be afraid of this. Now I just want to be this way. To love the law, to, to delight in the law, is the way you know that the splendor of what Jesus did on the cross is working in your life. You're not always feeling guilty. You're not always feeling cast down. You don't hate the idea of God telling you what to do. That's the way you know that the splendor of God is in your life. And if it's not in your life, you will find yourself resenting the law, either always feeling guilty or always feeling rebellious. Look, we need accountability because we live in a lawless age a hundred years ago, nobody even used the word accountability. You know why? It's the same reason that you can't ask a fish about water. The fish will say, what's water? Water is so pervasive to the fish, the fish doesn't even know it's there. It used to be just to live in the world, in any society, you were filled with accountability. It was everywhere. You couldn't live the life you wanted. You, were, you had obligations as a citizen, obligations as a, as a man or a woman, obligations as a brother or a sister, obligations as a husband or a wife. Today, the society will say, it's up to you. And therefore, we as Christians, we have to find friends. And we have to go to each other and say, I have a lawless heart. Even though I'm a Christian, I forget what Jesus did in the temple. And when I forget the gospel, I come to hate the law. And I feel guilty and unhappy. Oh, please help me, dear friend. Believe the gospel. Help me look at the splendor. Remind me of the splendor of what he's done so that I find I am delighting and joyful and grateful in all of my obedience. You need to have some friends that you can t say that to because we live in a lawless society that will make it virtually impossible for us unless we find accountability structures t t to come to love the law because we know Jesus has loved us. Do you have friends like that? Friends you can lay down your life for in little and big ways? Friends that you can come and talk to, hold each other accountable so that you don't slip back into the misery of lawlessness. Do you? Look for them. Oh, may the splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ destroy the power of lawlessness in my heart and yours that's making us so miserable today. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us the idea. Thank you for showing us about the Antichrist and the mystery of iniquity. Help us to see how it applies to us today and keep us from unnecessary speculations and distractions. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us in your Son the picture of ultimate reality, the mystery of grace, the mystery of life, my life for yours. Help us to be so moved by that that the secret powers that bind us will be broken in our lives and eventually forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.